So you're here at ISE and you are talking, if I get this right, at a panel that, that's about the emergence of master designers. So what's the difference between a master designer and a master systems integrator? integrator. Well, it was a great title, first of all, Emergence of the Masters. So I was straight away, yeah, <laughs> I'll do that, you know. <laughs> but uh, I suppose we're a master systems integrator. Yeah. And actually, we were talking about this yesterday in the sense that, you know, what exactly that, what is the difference between a, des a designer and, and an integrator? And are both roles important? And I suppose a, a designer is a consultant, a consultant led role and should be involved from, a, you know, as we'd say in the UK, from like stage zero or stage one in a construction project. So from that right. conceptual design yeah. and work with the work with the client to understand their needs and their wants and what, how their business works. An integrator would generally, uh, it's important for us to be involved in early stage two, but generally we'd come in around stage three. So when the, when the detailed design uh, begins, but importantly, before say the main contractor or the general contractor is appointed or before any specialist contractors are appointed, because for us, Projects go very well when we design the foundations of the building right first, right? It's the same, same in, in a construction context. If you get the foundations right first, the building's going to last forever. Right. And the same goes for, for SMART. If we design the data layer correctly yeah. and we agree in ontology, we agree simple things like naming schemes, then we start layering technologies on top. And if, if you try and start with the technologies, um, you start to, run in, start to run into problems. So. I think there's a role, for, there's definitely a role for both. You have the designer or the digital building consultant, mm -hmm. and then the MSI would come in, say, around stage three in a, in a construction project. So one of the things we, we, were, we were thinking of was, um, is there a common area that, that, that perhaps a common mistake or misunderstanding that people have uh, in, in these areas? There's still a lot of misconceptions around what a smart building is. In fact, right. maybe it's not clear, even in the industry, what a smart building is. And you'll often hear clients at, at design stage and they're very excited. There's a, you know exciting new building coming along. There's a big capital budget and you know somebody says, I want a smart building. And what a smart building is means different things to different stakeholders. So for you know the facilities team, it might be all about energy. Um, you know, sustainability, those kind of things from the, I suppose, the workplace teams. It might be kind of around fancy technologies and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, desk booking systems, smart lockers, even, you know, smart coffee machines. Yeah. And I think that's probably the biggest misconception is that it's all about the technologies. But for us, the smartest buildings are, and I'm, I'm going to go back to yeah. getting those foundations right first and actually... If you get that right first, you can any system that goes in after that. Yeah. So if you imagine any system in a building, yeah. say it's a, a, the biggest one would be, say, the BMS system or the building automation system. Yeah. And then you have all kinds of life safety systems and you have things like access control and lifts and then you've coffee machines and lockers and all these kind of things. Coffee, all machine, the, coffee machine seems to be a theme. I don't oh, it's know a big thing. Well, I mean, <laughs> see, we're all about the human. And like what really annoys people in work is when, you know, they go to the coffee machine and it, yep. and, and it doesn't work or there's yep. no coffee left or they go to the bathroom mm -hmm. and there's no uh, toilet roll left. You know, they're the things that really annoy humans. Mm -hmm. So if I, I say human sounds, it sounds very impersonal, but the, the, the people that occupy the building and we deal mainly with office buildings. So the only reason that building exists is to house the, the, the people, the occupants inside it. So those little things really, really count. So if you imagine all those systems, all of them produce data in, in some sense or form. And to date, all those systems have worked in silos and they've worked pretty well, but there's no common language between them. And, and that's what makes a building smart, is to normalize all that data. So we know if we're sitting in a room here, it's got a light fitting, it's got a thermostat. We need to know that somebody walked in here at exactly five minutes past one. It was in room 101, not RM 101 or not R1 or, you know. So if you imagine all those systems, when they were siloed, had different people having different naming schemes, the clocks might be slightly different. So that's when I talk about normalizing data. 
We throw all that then into a data lake and now we can start to see patterns in the data and AI can start to see patterns. So what happens on a wet Wednesday when there's 101 people in the building? We always run out of coffee. You know, that's a simple example. And that's what makes a building smart, is getting, getting all those siloed systems into the data lake for us to analyze. And for us, it's all about the human insights. Um, energy would be another. We always know on a Wednesday when there's a football match on, right. there's never more than 50 people in the building. So let's shut down one of those floors, open up the desk booking on floor one, and now we can save a bit of energy. Everyone knows where they're going. And uh, yeah, so that, that's what really makes, I mean, we talk about misconceptions, that's what makes a building smart when we have all these siloed systems actually communicating. You're perhaps unusual in that you have expertise in both AV, where you started out, yeah. and in smart buildings. How does having both those areas of expertise give you any insights that you wouldn't have if you were in just one area of them? I think um, in terms of user experience, so AV, yeah. um, you know, if, if you're a good AV contractor or integrator, you, you really, again, back to the human, you know, you're really human centric. So you're thinking, okay, I'm designing a boardroom. Let's make this really, really simple to use. And in fact, you know, we've moved on to like one touch join for meetings or, you know, when I walk up to a meeting room, it's, it's, it knows who I am. I don't have to do anything. And that exemplar user experience is very transferable into smart buildings. In fact, I think it's quite unique what AV integrators do and you know that. So you don't typically have that emphasis on the user experience in... In, in, in smart, smart buildings. Place. A lot of our competitors are really focused on energy. Right. And, you know, it's a very noble pursuit and it's very important. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we all have, you know, uh, targets to meet. We have the Paris, Par Paris Agreement, etc. Yeah. Uh, to meet. But the real value... And, and, and I'm talking about commercial office spaces, is really in the human. I don't know if you're aware of, are you familiar with JLL's 330-300 rule? No. And it's for every $3 we spend on utilities, yeah. we spend $30 on rent, and we spend $300 on payroll. Yeah. So the value is really in that human. You know? And that exemplar user experience that AV contractors are used to providing can really be transferred into that, that holistic view of a smart building. Well, that, that's a very good um, summary there. Thank you very much for that. I'm just about to check whether my building has a coffee machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, and, uh, and toilet roll. <laughs> oh, my Maybe we'll let it edit that out. All right. Well, thank you very much, Tomas. Thank really you very much, Guy. Delighted to be here. Thanks, thank Mel. You.